hypermanic noise. Welcome to another episode of the Hypermanic Noise Podcast. I'm your host, Douglas Harvey, and this week I'm here with my good mate, Jez Watts. Jez is a sick comedian from Perth, Australia. He's supported Brian Posehn and Joe Mande from the States, and he's fresh off a sold-out run at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. We spoke about Jez's background as a research scientist, the world of stand-up comedy, fuckhead promoters that rip off comedians, the state of pornography, and people who love inflatable animals. Yeah, as always, it was dark, dirty, and downright hilarious. I had a great time talking to Jez, and you're going to fucking love him. Without any further ado, let's do this shit. Podcast initiation sequence. Headphones. Check. Beer status. Cold and tasty. Check. Penis function. Hard, but unimpressive. Check. Podcast initiation complete. Warning. This episode may cause brain damage. Hypermanic noise. Okay, I'm here with Jez Watts. How are you, man? Yeah, uh, fine. That's good. <laughs> You've, tr- you've got like a Hugh Hefner thing going on here? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like um, the the times that I get to be in the house, like, why not wear a bathrobe? Fair uh, enough. Because it's the most comfy way to live. I, I've taken it to the movies, and uh, my girlfriend is not pleased. <laughs> but it's, I'm just disappointed. Super, it's super comfy. Yeah, I'm just disappointed your dick's not out, to be fair. I mean, we'll see how the podcast goes. Oh, well, good. It Let's... may well eventuate. Okay, well, I hope so. Well, speaking of... Uh... Yeah, I think this because might even... Dick's being out? Okay, great. Well, well, that's just an assumption I made from watching this, so let's let's see what you think of this. Mm-hmm. Okay. My name is Mark. I'm 20 years old, and I'm in a relationship with 15 inflatable animals. That's too many animals to be in a relationship <laughs> with. He's greedy. <laughs> like, 14 of those guys are not... Feeling good about like the fifth mate, <laughs> like he's. My inflatables are the funnest creatures I have to hang out with in my life. I'll eat with them. Wait, you want my food? You can share on. Watch TV together. Be fine. I'll find a show you like. If I bathe my inflatables, it's good. Sure. Snap. I do take my inflatables out swimming. I feel like this guy is not actually into inflatable animals himself, right? Yeah. I feel like he sat down and he's like, I need an identity. Like, yeah. who am I? Yeah. Like, I want people to know who I am. And yeah. he sat down in high school and he went, I'm going to be the inflatable animal yeah. guy. Mark's addiction to inflatables began six years ago when he purchased a whale for his pool. Since then, the 20-year-old college student has added 14 animals to his inflatable family and even prefers them over people. I mean, that's fair enough. <laughs> people are shitty. <laughs> the thing about inflatable pools ones I love is that they're soft, they're cuddly. The bigger they are, the better they are. Kind of means there's more to love. <laughs> I like, yeah, I only like like a real like live, yeah. athletic, an- like inflatable animal myself. Yeah, yeah. me too. And it's really nice to have somebody to talk to. No, Sammy, you don't get any of my soda, okay? When I first found out about Mark's inflatables, um, I thought, that's strange, or how can you be into something that's not really real? Mark first turned to inflatable the music love is great. and affection when he was 14 years old. My mother really wasn't there for me when I was a child. Shock. First time I had an inflatable whale, I actually started feeling all that love and compassion that I never got from my <laughs> I love here, like he back sasses with them and shit, like he argues with the animals. Really? They give him attitude. Now he's so dependent on his inflatables, he can't be separated from them for more than a day. When I'm at school, I start missing them, and it's almost like if I'm going a little bit crazy. Hey, Charlie. <laughs> Once I go home, now. <laughs> give him a hug, give him a kiss, spend like family time together. Okay, we can talk more about you if we want. Let's say every one of my inflatables has a different personality. A little down today, don't you? Some like different types of music, some don't. <laughs> some like to just be lazy and sleep all day. I would say they get along together pretty well. Fifteen of them do. <laughs> Fifteen of them prefer to sit quietly all day. 
<laughs> but I just love my favorite bit of that is um, where he says, "Okay, we, he's there at dinner. He's there at the dinner table, and he's got food laid out for them." And, uh-huh. and he goes, "All right, we can talk more about you if you want." <laughs> he's getting back sass. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I feel like, you know, he's every single day is going to be like, why are you eating, baby? Like, yeah. what? What's wrong? So fussy. I buy you all this nice food. <laughs> How the fuck does that happen? I mean, I do relate to some of it. Like, I mean... Uh, what? No, not the inflatable <laughs> animals thing. But, like, he's like, oh, I like my inflatable animals more than people, right? Oh. And I never really had pets. I had, like, a dog growing up. And my girlfriend's a veterinarian. And uh, we made an agreement when we first got together. So I'm allergic to uh, I'm allergic to rabbits. Really, I'm allergic to hay. Right, we're yeah. covered, in, covered in hay. And so we made an agreement when I first got together. We moved in together that we have one rabbit that lived outside in a hutch. Mm-hmm. And so then we had two rabbits that lived in the living room. Uh, so I would just be allergic to shit all day. Yeah. And now that we've moved in this new place where we are legally allowed to have two rabbits, and that's in the contract. Now, uh, like, Nicole has gone a little bit like, oh, great, we're allowed to have these two rabbits that we used to have to hide. So now I have license, I just have carte blanche to get as many animals as I want. Okay. And then I guess we'll just call them all the two rabbits. So now we've got, like, a bird, there's geckos, there's a box of bugs that, like, the geckos eat. <laughs> she just bought a horse. Like, <laughs> Does the horse live here? Not yet. Who fucking, <laughs> like, it lives nearby. <laughs> but I will say this, like, the animals, like, because I never really have had, like, uh, rabbits before, and I love these two rabbits now, like, I've been fooled into loving them. Yeah. I actually walked into a conversation, like, a Facebook uh, conversation she was having with a friend of hers about six months, eight months into the relationship, uh, and I just happened to wander into her room, and I was just, like, rubbing her shoulders, and I happened to glance over at the screen, and the last message she sent was to, like, her best friend, and she was like, yeah, I think Jez has been fooled into loving the rabbits. <laughs> Because it's all, like, been a plan. Yeah. And now I'm invested in them as, like, people, right? Like, they've yeah. got personality. And I like them a lot more than most people I know. Fair enough. I like Glenn uh, Grimwood, who I assume at some point you'll talk to on this podcast, yeah. right? Uh, he's my best friend. I like him more than the rabbits. But just... But, like, no other people <laughs> are better than the rabbits. Fair enough. Yeah. But if it was an inflatable rabbit, would you get hard? Did it... I actually show him fucking the inflatable? No. I think it's... I think it's platonic. I think, like, he, he loves them, but it's like a familial love. He said that to his family. It's not... An, he's not incest with the inflatable animals. You're putting that on it. I am. Okay? Because that's what I want This to is make. a healthy relationship I... with inflatable animal people. Yeah, it's it's really healthy. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Okay. I vote yes. I vote, you vote yes on inflatable love. Yeah, exactly. But I found it interesting. Most, most of them were sort of pool toys, and I think that there's other... I've seen like inflatable uh, pandas and at Halloween, like right. inflatable witches. Does he right. get his freak on? You know, at Halloween, does he just go, all right, inflatable Jason Voorhees? Or, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, it's the thing, it's weird when you fuck inflatable uh, Jason Voorhees because he never stops coming. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Yes! <laughs> all right, nice. <laughs> But of all the weird things you can like, there's a uh, there's women that are married to a bridge and um, yeah. I've, what's the what's the term for um, uh, you know people who who uh, is it Anna Animalia or some something where um, it's like first you need to have this one like I guess like mental deficiency where you imbue personalities to objects that are inanimate. Yeah, that yeah. like are inanimate objects. Then on top of that, you need to like want to fucking animate objects <laughs> so you have to have like two mental illnesses to get to the point where you're fucking something inanimate because because one of them would just be like oh that's the couch it's barry and like we you know he, he hangs out and stuff and then the other one is like i fuck barry i think he's gonna have two levels but what about a flashlight an animate object would you ever name your flashlight though because i feel like it's so much more gross it's called jess oh uh... <laughs> Well, now I feel scorned. Yeah, good. <laughs> Why, um, the real deal's right here, bro. I oh, know. Yeah. Well, you're too picky. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Plus, you don't want HPV. No, I don't. Well, <laughs> yeah. You can't get it twice. So I'm probably right. Yeah, right. That is true. But yeah. I've booby trapped my, uh, my girlfriend's pussy. <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> like, where, where does the sexual. Like, if I look at the oven, I don't get turned on. If I look at a bridge, I don't get turned on. Like, what sort of defect is going on in there? I think it's the similar sort of shit to what causes pedophilia, but obviously it's a less harmful... Well, I mean, I don't know. No, I'm just talking that, that whatever that disconnect Kids is. Kids are gorgeous. They are. Right? <laughs> yeah, okay. What's the thing? Yeah, I mean, when I was... Like, when I first started uh, jerking off, like, um, I didn't... 
I didn't know you're supposed to use your hand and stuff. And I was like, I think a lot of people do this. Like I started out like fucking the bed. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. we just sort of rubbing against it. And then eventually it's like, yeah. you were grinding that bed hard. Yeah. Uh, but I was never like attracted to the, to the bed. I was just yeah, like, true. this bed is a vessel for mm. my satisfaction. Mm. But I you know, be thinking about like women I saw in like computer advertisements or something. Yeah, the bras and things catalogue from yeah. the W was my goal. It's oh, amazing, like, Mother's how, Day. how little you used to need. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I couldn't... It, and then we'll do... become super depraved from the internet and just getting older and stuff yeah. and, like, and being familiar with things. But that being said, I sort of started out with um, tentacle rape, like, hentai stuff. Um, what? Well, the local... So, at the time, the internet was still, like, 56k, right? Dial up. Yep. And so, there was a local video store, like, around the corner from me... And they stocked like crazy fucking RX rated hentai anime stuff mm-hmm. on like VHS. Okay. And I used to go and rent those. And the guy, the 16 year old behind the counter or whatever was like, oh yeah, this looks like a cartoon. This is a kid. So that makes sense. Uh... And so that was like porn I could get. But then yeah. I just like, like started out getting like acclimated to sex on like tentacle rape monsters. Okay. And then I watched like real sex and I was like fuck is this like shit where's the tentacles yeah. motherfucker um so it was a weird uh, sort of about face that's a transition into regular people sex uh, for me i used to i had to mine all of the video all of the movies that i'd found some sort of stimulus in so oh yeah i had stuff yeah, like that as like well true lies this this scene where jamie lee curtis right is stripping for for um arnold schwarzenegger yeah like, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like in the dark and yeah. stuff. Yeah, he's like giving her instructions. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, the other one, Ghostbusters, two. <laughs> Just Bill Murray in general. Like, oh uh, well, yeah, him. But that guy's charismatic of, as fuck. Of all people, Sigourney Weaver. I was, I was gonna. Hope, I thought it might be the receptionist. Janine. Yeah, she got, she got freaky in the second one. Yeah. But Sigourney Weaver goes to bath the kid, and the slime comes out of the bath and tries to eat her and the kid. Yeah. And she's in this awful mumbra and she's not hasn't got a rack on her anyway yeah but for some reason i uh, that was well, this is the thing it's like it's those moments i think when you're that young because like you, you're just getting your like your hormones yeah. and stuff right so it's like anything could kind of set you off there's this movie i think it was called oh it might have been called scanners it was um it was about this sort of uh, it was like this sci-fi thing where this, the machines on this world had gone crazy. Okay. And like, had, and like started hunting humans and then they were like living like underground in bunkers and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, the machines like had kept getting like more and more advanced and now they could like make machines that looked like humans and they're like infiltrating the humans and stuff. All right. And there was like this whole thing of like, oh, are you a secret agent? Like, oh, they can make people that like don't know the machines and stuff. And there's this whole subplot and right near the end of the movie... It turns out this this sort of main love interest turns out to be one of the machines, mm-hmm. uh, and then like the evil like but she's like oh but I love you human guy you should get away and then like a, a doppelganger of her like shows up who's like still evil, and there's a point where she's trying to sort of seduce the dude out of the ship and mm-hmm. she just said this one line like you know we can kiss we can love we can fuck and just like the way uh... she smiled. There was that like this three second loop of that VHS that yeah. I ruined by just watching. She, yeah. There was no titties. There was nothing so, other than just in her eyes is this glint of like we can fuck. Nice. And I just I watched that so many times in my brother's <laughs> room because he was the only one that had a a room in he had a TV in his bedroom, and so I used to jerk off in my brother's <laughs> room. <laughs> well, <laughs> the up. other the other two that I remember was Cruel Intentions. That yeah. Had some great moments. Yeah. And obviously. Oh, that really did, didn't it? Yeah. That was the threesome, right? Yeah. Sarah Michelle Gellar making out with the nerdy chick. There was yeah. just so much. And then um, American Pie when that came out. Yeah. I went with the um, Shannon Elizabeth. Oh. Yeah. yeah. To this day, I reckon Wild that things. could do it for me. Wild Things was pretty. Bad. Yes, I've watched same yeah. thing. That's pool scene. Yeah. The, the fifteen second scene. Yeah. Play rewind. Play rewind. Yeah. What creeps we are. Yes. <laughs> but it does worry me though. I sound like such an old fuddy daddy. We had to work to get anything as far as sexual stimulus. That's and right true, now yeah. on my on my phone, if I say woman fucking a horse and a cat, yeah. search it, it'll come up. Yeah, I mean you can go in the next room and Nicole's doing that. Yeah, so. I'm sure. <laughs> but 
you know what I'm saying? Like what? Yeah, no. Well, this is the thing. It's, it's scary. No, but I think it's it's great. It is great. The only problem I think is like because we keep getting desensitized to like the like the advancing frontier of depravity. We keep having to go further yeah. to get the same uh, like titillation. But uh, I've spoken to people who've like taken a week off or taken a, like a month off, like porn, and yeah. they're like, oh, you kind of reset apparently. Yeah. But I have never done this. I choose not to. What's, I really like my porn. What? What's the point? Yeah, I mean, the, I haven't gotten to a point where I'm like, oh, fuck, the things I need to get hard yeah. are so crazy that I feel bad about myself. No. If I get to there, I'll take a week off. But, like, yeah. I'm, all, I'm all right. I just like watching... I mean, my, my, main, my main thing with porn is I like to watch a girl genuinely have a good time. Yeah. Like, for real be coming, for real be enjoying it. Yeah. And I can tell where they're acting. Mm. And as long as that's happening, whatever else is there is fine. I just really like girls coming. So you're not into anal porn, then? Um, because there are occasionally, every now, I'm, I'm not generally for that reason. Yeah, I know. Every now and then there is, there is someone who's genuinely having a good time. I know time exactly what you mean, but yeah. that sometimes you look at the face and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. I'm getting oh, paid money. Yeah, give it, oh, that's oh, great. And give me that money, give me that paycheck. And it's basically as if, you know, a Nazi in Auschwitz asked them, are you having a good day? Yes, sir, I'm having a of great course. day. Of course, yeah, yeah. There's nothing, I, I don't enjoy watching people suffer. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah, so you're okay as well. Then. Yeah. Well, yeah, neither one of us have gone too far. No, no. I did have a teacher that got done for child porn. Really? Yeah, and his excuse was that he was looking for pictures of women's breasts and it got out of hand. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever Have you ever had a picture of a kid come up by accident? Uh, I, no, I'm going to, I'm going to say no. Yeah. It, I think the answer is no, but like, I, I was just, I was. But I even if it had, you would have got out of it. it but no, 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 It, it doesn't sure. yeah, fucking yeah. happen. Yeah. Well, I had this thing, um, I did years ago. Um, I, f- I fell out with this dude over it. So this, I don't think happens anymore, but like back in the day, because it took so long to find porn, sometimes you would just have a hard drive filled with porn and you'd have friends who also had a hard drive filled with porn. So and you'd do a little swapsy. My friend had one, and they called it the archives. Right. And it was 300 gig of porn. Wow, that's too much. <laughs> it is too much. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I had how much I had, and uh, my friend had how much. And, and we got to talking, and... Uh, and, and we were like, oh, we'll do a little swap. And like I, I met him when I was uh, in the army, but he was like a reasonable... Uh, a reason uh, he seemed like a reasonable person like a lot of those people are fucked up yeah <laughs> uh, um, but yeah so we swapped these hard drives and then on the thing first of all mine was beautifully catalogued and indexed yeah. and his was a mess mm-hmm. and I don't like that like oh, file names all over the place and, and no, no no categorization you how wanna, dare you we want to be able to find your scan. I want to yeah you want to find certain things yeah. at a certain time uh, but he had stuff which was like you know like uh, you know, so young and like and like young enough to be illegal and all, this, and all these kinds of things oh. and I looked at a couple and I was like that girl really that girl looks like 14 or 12 or whatever plus the video is like titled that and uh so i like probably should never have brought it up with him i guess but like i afterwards was like dude what the fuck are you looking at man like well, you can't be joking off to kids and he was like oh man they're not really kids it's just builders kids they just find women that look like kids and i was like okay but why are you joking off to people because they look like kids like yeah. that's and like after that like we just had a really tense relationship and like we ended up falling out not necessarily over that, but I think it was that he knew yeah. that I knew yeah. and that I like, wasn't into it. And it was such, you know, big sort of fetish thing for him that he was just like, oh, I can't have this person in my life. He knows too much Jesus about me and he's against Christ. it. But yeah, it was I've never swapped porn with anyone ever again. Uh, like, I was uh, like, I don't want to know. That's so fucked. Yeah, I felt is, really gross about it. But like what you're talking about with the bed. A kid is as sexual as a letterbox or a can of Coke. I look at it and I'm like, there's a kid. Yeah. And then a dude walks past, there's a dude. And then a chick walks past, I'm like, there's a sexual being. You know, that's just the way my brain is programmed. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, yeah, I mean... It's, Obviously, it's, a it's, male is a sexual being, but yeah, it's just, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. just doesn't flick my being. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, uh, this is the thing, really, when you look at the history of human beings, like, it's actually only a recent development that we wait till everyone hits sexual maturity, exactly. which is really fucked up when you think about it. Because actually, for m- like more time of human history, like 
Older dudes, always older dudes, have been basically fucking kids until recently. When now, I mean, which is what I agree with, obviously, but yeah. society's programmed me for that. Um, we just wait for everyone is kind of consenting and knows what's going on and is fully developed, and then we're like, okay, cool, now you can do your fucking. But it's yeah, so weird to think like even a few hundred years ago, like really two young girls mm-hmm. were in relationships, like and pregnant to a 30, 30 year old guy. Yeah. And that was just the standard. Mm. Yeah. I mean, this is just depressing The good old now. days. Yeah, the good old days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I have a younger girlfriend, but she is not that much younger. Yeah. Well. And also, she's a lot more mature than I am. Like, she hasn't thrown her life away on comedy. Well, she's, well, <laughs> she's thrown her life away for someone that's thrown their life away on comedy. Yeah. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, she straight up just, like, looked at me real sad. And she was like, hey, uh, you know, I, I can't keep giving you money. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, baby, this is the worst it's ever going to get. And she went, yeah, you say that, but... Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it is genuinely the worst it's ever going to get. Like, I just came back from Edinburgh and, like, that's the most expensive thing I'll do. Yeah. And uh, every festival this next year will pay for itself and it'll all be fine. But it was like, this year is like this building year mm. where I just threw huge amounts of money to tour um, in order to, like, be able to make more money and, and, like, sort of get set up in these cities so that when I come back, I can make more, make actual cash. Yeah. But it's like, fuck, that's a terrible investment to make when it's not even you. Like when it's yeah. when it's your partner and you care about him, but it's like you work 40 hours a week or whatever mm. as a doctor. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like in an intense environment and then you just like kind of throwing your money away. Well, also, the love, the it's love. not like you're, it's not like you're some fucking idiot that all you've ever done is work at KFC. Well, you're, no, that's the thing. I, when we got together, we were both going to be doctors. And you're, but you, like, what, what are your degrees in again? Uh, so I've got four degrees. So I've got a uh, bachelor's of biotechnology with a minor in applied statistics. Then I've got a bachelor's of molecular biology. Then I've got an honors, to, uh, like a bachelor's with honors of biomedical science. And then I've got a, master, a master's in neuroscience. Yeah. And that was the thing when we got together, I was doing my doctorate and I was like, yeah, you're going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. Woo. So you trapped her basically. Well, I genuinely believed I was going to be a doctor, (laughs) but it was like, it was almost literally the week that I did my first open mic. Like we went like sort of hung out like on sort of a date. Yeah. And, um, and I went, listen, I'm going to be doing this, but I am still going to get my doctorate. And I thought I was, and that's why I put the masters is I was like two thirds of the way through the doctorate and, and comedy just started taking up okay. so much more time that I was like, I can't finish it. And, and so almost as a favor to my supervisor in the lab I was working with, I, I wrote up what I'd done as like a master's thesis and submitted that, but just so they didn't look like fucking idiots for yeah. taking on some so, idiot comedian, you know? So you, you were working on, um, research towards regenerating spinal cord damage that's true yes that is, that is correct so does that that involves discs or the cause the um re- so what i, spinal I um, cord itself yeah so my background was more uh, more to do with like genetics right so okay. um the angle i was taking and it was and like i to to people in general when they ask about it normally like the eyes glaze over like 10 seconds into an explanation so I have like a real super quick one which is I'm like oh, I'm trying to find a way to get people like with spinal cord injury to walk again yeah. and then everyone's happy with the explanation and we yeah. can all walk away uh, but what I was specifically trying to do um, was find this way to manipulate um, what's called RNA which yeah. is like a regulatory part of the genetic framework yeah I'm sure. uh, Cool. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, manipulate RNA um, to uh, switch off these things that were sort of preventing uh, plasticity in the central nervous system okay. and uh, switch on other things which sort of encourage regeneration. Because there's like other vertebrates that are like sort of lower vertebrates, like, sort of like fish and frogs and stuff like that, um, who to some extent uh, can regenerate central nervous system. So if you cut the spinal cord or the optic nerve, they can yeah. grow that shit back. And in humans, you can't. And basically, the way it worked was that as you get like more complicated as a vertebrate, um, there was this almost stepwise decrease in regeneration yeah, of the central okay. nervous system. So we're like, okay, cool. We can like turn off this shit locally that is necessary for us to be complex, to grow, but just turn it off while someone's injured, you know, in that area, then it'll automatically regrow because that those genetics are still there like those genes that do that are there they're just getting switched off okay because they need to be switched off for us to be like super complicated okay and so that's what we were trying to do 
and I uh, like I mean I, I made some level of progress towards that but it was if it seemed like I was definitely gonna fucking fix it like I probably would have stuck with it okay and like finished the doctorate but I was like ah this is probably gonna be negative anyway I'm probably gonna end up being like well it kind of almost maybe works but not really mm-hmm. and so at that point I was like well I've got dick jokes to tell I gotta leave yeah well I've got a bit of an ulterior motive because my back is fucked. Yeah, my back's <laughs> fucked. I'm you know, not going back. Like it would be better for me if your comedy career died in the ass and I you went know. back to it and fixed my back. So It'd be probably be better for a lot of audiences. Give it too. up. I'm gonna have to talk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna have to come and talk to Nicole and um, say, "Look, I'm on your side here. Let's fucking get him back in the lab." Yeah. Do well, you miss it? I um, I always loved doing science. Uh, I loved, um, I love being in a lab. I love more researching stuff and, uh, and, and like sort of like reading, reading like papers on the sort of bleeding edge of stuff. And, and that was sort of like a, a, a little bit different fields and then realizing how those findings could, uh, like mash together into like new, like synthesizing information from sources. Okay. I always fucking loved doing that. Um, and I, and I quite liked lab work and I really liked, you know, when things worked out. Uh, when it did, it was frustrating as fuck. But um, science and comedy have always been two things I've both, I've really loved, like since I was very young. Um, but comedy is more gratifying. Both of them pay shit. Is the thing. Yeah. <laughs> both of them pay so bad. They're terrible. Um, science, you are on a wage, but science really does. Like I ran into somebody in like wearing high vis on the street the other day, and uh, he's a guy I used to study science with. And he, he, def, he was doing his honours and he maybe did his masters and he was a good scientist and he was wearing high vis on the street as I walked by and I was like, oh, sh-. and he was like, hey, Jez, how you doing? And I was like, oh, shit, how you doing, man? So you're doing this now? Like, uh, what happened with the science stuff? And he was just like, no money, competitive as fuck. Yeah. I just left. And uh, I was like, so are you enjoying this work? He was like, yeah, I guess it's fine. I was like, uh, yeah. money? And he was like, yeah, I'm getting paid four times as much as I was getting paid as a scientist. And this is the thing, you spend, I spent like eight years in university, you spend so, so many years studying and really hard and you have to be smart, but you've also got to be dedicated and really work and gear your whole life around the same way with comedy. And you're saddling yourself up with debt And well. Yeah, absolutely. Like I've got huge hex debt and stuff. Yeah. Um, and really the end result of that is for most people who go into, particularly research, for most people who go into research, you leave after a few years, mm-hmm. you produce some stuff that the broader scientific community gets to use but you now have a specialized degree like what job can i walk into where i'm like oh so i've got a master's in neuroscience does that help me make coffee for people or what like Mm. like there's not really an application for these things if anything it makes it worse i mean i worked in it's like you're overqualified exactly because you're not qualified for anything yep but you've got these super high degrees and they're like oh okay well Mm -hmm we can't pay you what you think you'd be worth or whatever, or obviously you're looking for something else. Well, I had the same problem. I worked in engineering for seven years and then I was trying to get jobs at Subway and just anything like that. Yeah. And they would tell me, look, you're too good for this job. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I I need money. I applied for this job. I don't want to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, I, I find it ironic because science is notorious. Research is notorious for paying shit. Yeah. But applied science pays well, really well. Well, this is the thing. If you do work in the sort of the private sector, you can have a decent, you have a good income or a decent income at least. Um, but so many people who get into science get into it for the same as comedy for the passion yeah. that they have for it. Because if you just wanted to make money, you would do a three-year business degree and be a businessman. Exactly. And you would get paid a bunch of money. And so loads of people who, loads of people get into research science leave and leave the field completely. And then uh, there's probably, a, I would say probably a third of them mm-hmm. maybe would go into the private sector. And they do like having money, but like it's often very repetitive work. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you're like quality control at a food production company, it's not like, you didn't you didn't go to university <laughs> no. and be like, oh, I cannot wait to inspect this assembly line every day. <laughs> yeah. But it's ironic, right? Because it's like, I wanted to do big things. Yeah, well, with the, so... Guys that are doing research, chemistry, biology, physics, mm. without the information they're coming up with, you wouldn't be a you wouldn't have the ability to do physiotherapy, psychology, or Absolutely. psychiatry. But they never they never get rewarded for that. No, but the others do. Absolutely. Well, this is the thing: society does. Society exactly. Society treats research scientists as a 
resource. Yeah. They get they get recruited in and then used up and then spit out. But and the, so we as a civilization gain the benefit, but they just don't get rewarded. And that's just how it is. And I think a lot of it is it's an out of sight, out of mind. You don't encounter yeah. research scientists in well, day to day life. Everyone assumes that they get paid a lot of money. Yeah. That doesn't know. Same with the uh, vets, like my girlfriend's a vet. Uh, everyone assumes they get paid fuckloads of money. Okay. They get paid very poorly and they learn all the same medicine as, as a, doctor. a doctor for humans. And, and it's more varied. Yeah, it, that's the thing. They have yeah. to learn all these different animals and the like, dog can't tell you where it hurts and all that kind of stuff. But on top of that, like they get treated like shit. Like people, the clients who come in, treat them like they they are parasites who are trying to just suck money out. But it's just like medicine's expensive, machines are expensive, and people don't want to spend the money on their dog That's to, the other when thing. they have health issues. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to buy. My dog has a um, propensity for bladder infections and right. things like that. And she had yeah. a big bladder stone, so it cost us a few thousand dollars to get it fixed, and now we have to feed her this food, which costs four or five times what normal dog food costs. Right. But people won't do that. No, no, no. And exactly. then it'll come to a point where they need another operation yeah. and they'll abuse the shit out of the fit, uh, of the vet. Yeah. Or they'll say, just put my dog down. Exactly. And the vet's like, what yeah. the fuck? Sometimes there's like cheap operations you could do and they're like, ah, fuck it. You know? And then, and not only that, the vet's like built a relationship with this animal yep. over years of treating them. Mm. And generally vets prefer the animals over the humans as well. Of so course. it's like... Now this human fucking cunt face person is like, nah, I don't really want to spend a few hundred bucks. Can you kill my dog? Yeah, just kill the dog for me, you know? And like, uh, <sighs> yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal industry. And on top of that, they really don't get paid very well. But like people just assume because there's money going somewhere, like they put it on the face, you know? So it's same with science. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's money in drugs. We've heard about that. There's money in science. There's money in medicine. So therefore, if you're in that field in any degree, mm. you've got all the money because you're the person I've met. Yep. Yeah, and so, yeah, so people who know research scientists obviously know how shitty it is. And, yep. and But any time I mention to someone, like, I used to be in neuroscience, they're like, oh, fuck, yeah, you just said it was... And I'm just like, no, I, I did horrible grunt work yep. in a laboratory and, like, worked for... Because I did, what, let's say, probably three and a half years of full-time research, right? Like, because I did a, a one-year honours degree and then, like, two and a half on the master's thesis. I got paid like a, a bare living wage mm. to do that. And and I was in a good position. Like I got more grant money than most people who were doing those things. Okay. And uh, yeah, most people get even less than that. But yeah, everyone just assumes you're getting, you're, you're getting paid because it's hard. But it's like there's loads of things that are hard that people don't get benefits for. I find it funny too, even about stand-up, because people say, uh, so you get a, Oh, people we, assume you're getting paid every night. Yeah, and we both up. we both supported Brian Posehn. Yeah, sure. And everyone, oh fuck, man, that's awesome. A guy from America. Yeah. Oh, did you, you know, did you get paid well? Uh, I don't, you know, no, but we didn't. <laughs> but we. Yeah, I mean, I would have paid to. Put open I was going to say that obviously. exact thing. I would have paid to do that yeah. because of the opportunity. But Absolutely. When people say, "How much do you get paid for a gig?" and you say, "What type of gig?" Yeah. Well, all your gigs. Well, open mics, you get paid nothing. Yeah. Why? And the, the best analogy I've got from being in the music industry and all that is when you're in a band, you go into the jam room, you write your songs, right? you so, get them solid, you edit them, you get it all sorted, and you've got a piece of music, a piece of art that you're going to present to people. Yeah. And they can either love it or hate it or be indifferent. But with comedy, you can sit at home and do all that. But unless you get up at an open mic, mm. you never know if it works. And you can still... And also with comedy, the difference is... If Metallica gets up and plays Metallica songs, mm. a percentage of the audience is going to love it and a percentage of the audience isn't because that's not their thing. Mm. But with comedy, if you, your job is to make the people laugh mm. and it doesn't matter whether they're fans of Bill Cosby, Jerry Seinfeld, Bill Burr or Jim Jeffries. Mm. If you don't make them laugh, you've you failed. failed. Yeah. And it's, people don't get that. Yeah. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of open mic comics don't get that. No. <laughs> But yeah, no, absolutely. It's your job to make people laugh. Um, but yeah, I mean, on top of that, like you have to, uh, I mean, some people write a little bit differently. Some people are good at writing off stage and then bring it to stage and it's pretty well done. David Tuffley. Oh, uh, I was actually, this is exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Of. He writes great jokes, but even he's like still tweaking that like, once exactly. he gets on stage. Um, but my stuff particularly, like if I haven't done it on stage six, 10, 15 times, then it is 
there are loads of things about it that change over that period of time. Yeah. And, and once I've been doing a, a bit or an idea or whatever for a few months, it's like, okay, well now it is what I had in my head, mm. which is interesting. I needed to have the back and forth interplay of me and the audience and different rooms um, in order to get to the idea I had. Whereas at, with a band, you can go to the studio mm-hmm. and just work on that and you can have the interplay of each other. Um, but yeah, you can't you can't get that in comedy. Um, no, and it's I, I find it interesting. Yeah, but I mean, on top of that, even once you've got good stuff, half the time you're not getting paid because promoters are pieces of shit, or there's just not money in it. Like yeah. I, I, because we, I obviously I run um, like a small production company. Like we run an open mic and we run shows at festivals and stuff. I've never been able to pay comics what I want, what I know they deserve. Yeah. Because I don't have the money. Like I've we've been running it for three half three and a half like four years we are still in debt to the company because we've paid out more than we've made. Yeah, I get that. But as it is, I'm like not paying anyone near what they deserve. Well, I wasn't... And it's, it's just... It's, it's art is fucked. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And, but this is what shits me. I was involved in a show over here that mm. did really well. Mm. Oh, yeah. It was sold out many shows We don't need to say the name, but I know No, we one. don't. Yeah. And I took at least 70 payers... To shows I was involved in at right. $25 a ticket Ooh, 13 so sold out shows I got paid $50 two of those shows were at Southbound Festival $50 mm. now fuck you <laughs> <laughs> fuck you they're not going to listen but if you are fuck you You're like yeah. 50 I, that didn't even pay for a third of the parking I paid yeah the fuel to get there I don't drink so they did put some drinks on yeah but even that was fuck all yeah and that is what shits me and with that too, it got to a point where I was being involved in Side Splitter Comedy Festival, Rotto Fest. Sure. And look, I've, I've got good sets and bad sets, and I'm not somebody that overstates their skill. Right. But for that show, being a show that involved rapping and comedy, yeah, it's pretty obvious what I'm talking about now. <laughs> I um I'm still confused. No, no, no. I'll, I'll explain to you later. <laughs> so on the but I can rap. Yeah, Most comics sure. can't. Yeah, yeah. And I never had a bad show and I killed it. And they yeah. didn't look after the people that got them there. Right. And that's what shits me. And for me, and there's this famine mentality of there's not enough success to go around. Right. I, um, when I got the support... Wait, what do you mean by there's not enough success to go around? When I got the support for Brian Posehn. Oh, yeah. People get fucking shitty about yeah. stuff. I personally don't subscribe to that way of thinking. Like, no. I, I feel like... Um, like, some people, I think, see uh, comedy specifically as, like, a zero-sum game, where if you, one person gets something, well, that's... You You didn't get it now, because they got it. That's, yeah, I personally, Yeah, I personally feel like uh, it's, it's more accurate to look at it as, like, the rising tides, like, lift all boats, right? If you know somebody... And they get something, or they uh, they 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 write this really funny joke or whatever that's way funnier than what you do. It's like the fact that you know them means that their success will, in some way, bleed over to your success. Whether it's just you get to meet a cool person and who's been doing it for twenty years, because you're like, oh wow, cool man. And they're like, mm. oh, come along and see the show, and then like you get to talk to that person and like gain their knowledge in that way. Yeah. Or like the fact is, like if you don't be a cunt to people. I mean, that's really the big secret of it. But if you don't be a cunt to people, their success will, in some measure, they'll be able to help you out at some point. Like, yep. if my friends get famous or they get just successful or they get some opportunity, at some point, there'll be a spot on a lineup that, that the promoter needs someone. They're like, oh, my friend Jess, why don't you use him? Yep, exactly. And I always try to help out people when I can. Yep. And uh, the people I'm closest with share that mentality and I, I do not understand this thing of like oh I need to hold you down so I can step over you exactly because that's fucked and Wouldn't also it's it's we're, we're in comedy like the stakes are so low and it's not a, <laughs> and it's not a what com- the fuck is stakes? I don't know it's not a competition either yeah no that's and the I thing. hate comedy competitions for I, that I do I think because it sets everyone against each other yep. but wouldn't you want So say... But I want comedy to win. I want there to be the most funny things in the world at any one time. Mm. And so anytime someone gets something or someone does something, I'm like, great, more comedy. Yeah, so say it's an alternate alternate universe. Yeah. I become the next Jim Jeffries. 
Right. Would I want to tour with people I don't know or my friends that are funny? Exactly. You yeah. Uh, I think it was in like Steve Martin's book or he talked about it afterwards that like, cause he quit comedy when he was like on top. I'm not yeah. like a huge Steve Martin fan necessarily, but he said that if he had known he could have brought his friends with him to open, he never would have quit. Yeah. It was that he would tour on his own. And now everybody does that. Every yeah. big dude brings people that they get along with that are still funny, yeah. but like they're friends. To, yeah. to tour with because then you get to do it collaboratively exactly um, yeah. like I've I, I've spent a, a fair bit of time over the last couple of years like going to Melbourne and Sydney and sometimes I've done that with my best friend Glenn and sometimes I've done that alone and it's fine when you're alone because there's still comics around you can still talk but when you go with your best friend it's so much different it's so cool it's so fun That's, It's yeah. you write so much more you get so much more excited about things you have to go as like a unit into environments and be like oh you know this guy and that guy blah 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 it's just everything about it is is what comedy should be that's what I miss about being in a band right The co- like the collaboration the bro- it's a brotherhood the, yeah of and course you know I've had my old bass player hi Alex before one of our tours once I had him by the throat over the top of a flight of stairs because we got into an argument. Yeah. And that was the first date of a tour. But we're still, he's still my brother. Like, right. I take a bullet for him. Yeah. And uh, it's, the thing I find too on this whole famine mentality thing is Kieran Lyons, right? Right. Great comedian. He's got his audience. He's got his style. Yeah. He does what he does. He's now on the radio. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't look at that and think, fuck that guy. He's 17. He's got no life experience. I mean, he's 20 now. Oh, uh, He's a ripe old age of 20. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't look no. at that and think, fuck that young cunt. No, it's, he's got, it's awesome. It once makes... he lived in 20 years, I look at that and go, wow, if he can do that, that means I might be able to do that one day. That sure. means, you know, there's it just shows you what's possible. No, absolutely. And on top of that, like, Kieran is the sweetest guy you'll meet. Yeah. He helps me out all the time. Exactly. All the time. And he thinks nothing of it. And like we're just friends, and even it is weird to be friends with a twenty year old, and also be- <laughs> because I don't um, necessarily like love the jokes he tells. Like they're very well written. I will always say that he's great. Uh, he's a great. Um, uh, he's great structurally with the stuff that he writes, and it's yeah. very tightly written. They're just not jokes for me. Is the only thing. Yeah, I get it. Um, but um, but yeah, like, I love giving him shit about how like I don't love his comedy but then I never I always expect him to do well because he's a good comic yeah and I always tell people he's going to do well if they ask because mm. he's a good comic exactly and it doesn't matter that I don't like exactly what he's talking about it's just not for me I'm just not in his demographic mm. and, and nor should I be I'm 34 mm. and he's a 20 year old kid <laughs> yeah <laughs> like he's appealing to a whole group of people that I don't really have anything to say to like I can get laughs out of him but I can't necessarily relate to them on the same level, you know? Like, people who are a little bit older... Because yeah. I talk about being married, I talk about, um, like, uh, past with drugs, I talk about the things that affect me as a 34-year-old. It's like, seven, the 17-year-old kids who are his fan base will only laugh at the stuff that I do that's just dirty for them, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And that's fine. I'll do well in front of their, his crowd, but we're not competing for the same people. And even if we were, people, like, people can be fans of two different comics, Yep. Like I love every, Seinfeld and I love Jim Jeffries. Everyone's yeah. a fan of loads of different comedians. Yeah. Like you are never ever competing for somebody else's fan. No. You could share them quite easily. Yeah. Yeah. But um Well Louis C. K for me, mm. I've watched a lot of his stuff. Right. Does nothing for me. I love and the guy. I, so, I I know that's common, but like But, but it, I genuinely it should. do. Yeah. He is exactly what I like and mm. I listen to his jokes. And I get that they're brilliant. Yeah. But it just doesn't tickle that bone in me. Right. And there's no... I can't fault anything he does. Well, that's the thing. Comedy is the most subjective yeah. art form, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's and that's the thing. That's actually what's beautiful about it, too, um, is that uh, because it's so subjective, when you do connect with someone, like, or, like when someone connects with your comedy, it's, it's a much deeper connection, I think, than... For me, I'm biased. Obviously, you had a, a career in music. Yeah. I think it's like a deeper connection than music. It is. Because I think music is more universal and comedy is more individual. Well, Ramstein. Yeah. I really bit, like Ramstein. Yeah. Do you know what they're saying? Nah. No. So there you go. They're not... They're, they're not, just fun. Dude. Exactly. <laughs> they're not telling you anything, are they? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. It's... it's um, and I can... You can listen to Bach. There's no words. And it right. was written... Fuck whenever he was alive. Yeah. And it still carries now. Oh, it's But if I tell someone's jokes from 1980... 
Full, yeah. Even if I stole Eddie Murphy's act. Exactly. He's got a... I've got Eddie Murphy comedian. I'll be comedian. homophobic as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie Murphy, the comedian album, has yeah. a song called... Uh, a track called Faggots. Yeah. Can you imagine trying that to me? Well, like, I think it's a Patrice O'Neill quote that, like, uh, comedy doesn't age like wine, it ages like bread. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Fuck, man. Oh, dude, this has been super fun. I want to um, oh, yeah. play a game with you. This is called Cunty Question. <laughs> All right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so, so you're a smart guy. Ah, uh, well. Yeah, well. I'm smarter, in, I'm smarter than I'm funny, I'll say that. You're intelligent. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know about sensible. Um, so, Matt's question. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Train leaves Perth station at 3 p.m., travelling north. It's moving at 80 kilometres per hour, and it's running express, express to Butler Station. <laughs> what year did drummer Neil Pert join the rock band Rush? <laughs> Uh, 1981? 1974. Oh, fuck. Well, I'll you, tell you uh, what. I took a stab in the dark. Yep. Also, my brother lives in Butler, and uh, I, yeah. everyone would kill themselves on that train before I got there. It would, yeah. <laughs> Including Neil Pert from Rush. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh-huh. what's your favourite genre of pornography? Uh, coming. On a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, 10 comes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You get in the hang of this. Um, okay. So, you can have sex with Melania Trump anytime you want. All right? But you got to right. suck off Donald first. Yeah. You can have sex with Beyonce anytime you want. Uh-huh. But you've got to suck off Jay-Z first. Uh-huh. Or you can have sex with Susan Boyle anytime you want, and uh-huh. you don't have to suck anyone off. Uh-huh. What are you going with? I've got a gun to your head. You have to pick one. They're all good options. I kind of want to... Can I just suck off Kanye? Uh, why? I don't know, man. I feel like a guy that confident must have, like, some powerful cum. Like, I feel like he's... he's <laughs> Like, he believes in himself so much. And if I could, like, like take some of his cum... His jizz. His, like, charisma jizz. His essence. And yeah. His essence, you know? And then maybe I could, like, pull off what Kanye does. I don't want to fuck any of those people. <laughs> Are you going to pick one? No, I, I guess <sighs> Melania Trump. I think is a robot sent from fucking outer space. Uh, otherwise, ha- like, how could she have not killed herself by now? Beyonce, but then you've got. Ah, to... uh, I'm not even. I'm meant to Beyonce. Well, but what are the? These are your options. Susan Boyle, because I I recognise the name, but I can't picture who it is. Oh, really? Yeah, I I genuinely. The X Factor old lady. Uh, that, uh, all right, that sounds she... interesting. Oh, she's a stunner. All right, all right, cool. Basically, you could go with um. You could go with what's uh, Gina Reinhart, mm-hmm. sort of any of those. Let's see. Let's see. That's her there. Oh, man. She must have some big old titties, though. Uh, I don't know. All right. I'm going to f- I'm gonna fuck her because that seems like it would be interesting. She's got a good voice. You could, All right. You could get her to sing songs to you. All right. Whatever you want. Um, one more. That's a terrible answer to that question. <laughs> Yeah. You picked none of the options and said you wanted to give Kanye a blowjob. Yeah, I don't know. I just watched um, what's his name? Uh, you know the guy who did the the the, the YouTube special? Uh, what Bo Burnham? Uh, I just watched his like second special again, yeah. and he did like a Kanye uh, sort of like rant at the end of the thing. And I just had that in mind. Okay. But like, I want to have like lights. Like, I'll suck off Kanye, but I want to have lights, like huge, huge spotlights coming from all sides. Yeah. So like, it's all like white light. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. As I blow him. You stage. are. You are <laughs> fucked. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So one more. <laughs> I've got a gun to your head, and you've got again. F- yeah. Okay. I've got a lot of. Uh, this is pretend we're in America. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, <laughs> okay. You've got to. You got to. These are your options for survival. You've got to go down on Pauline Hanson every day for a year. And you have to make it come every single time. That's probably salty. No fingers either. I want to just all tongue work. Uh, um, no sex. That fish and chip puss I don't think is going to oh, be good. Oh, grease, yeah. Some, probably some batter and crumbs down there. <laughs> um, no sex or jerking off for a year. No sex or jerking off for a year. For a year. Or uh, Katy Perry shits in your dinner every day for a year and you have to finish every meal. Ah. <sighs> I think, yeah, I gotta have, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take Katy Perry shit. I exactly, think. that's what I took. You get to watch her do it, and you can pick what angle. I gotta be honest, I don't give a shit about Katy Perry. It's just I, I'm not 
going to eat that fish of the day fucking <laughs> vagina. <laughs> and I'm also like, couldn't last a year. Yeah. If you have a gun and I'm going to get shot day, yeah. day two. You can put sauce on her shit, like barbecue sauce. I mean, yeah, I'll choke it down. But yeah. like, I like uh, that's not because I like Katy Perry. That's just I don't either. Those other two options are impossible. Okay. <laughs> that's good. All right, on that note. Let's wrap this up. That was awesome, Jez. Thanks cool. for talking to me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Jez, what's everybody?